Well, good morning. So good to see all of you this morning. Um, so glad that you've been able to join us uh, through our live stream. Uh, once again, we are in a, a different place. Things look a little different. I feel like every time we've, uh, we've live streamed, uh, we've been in a different location, and that's in part because uh, we've had so many difficulties with our live streaming. And when I say we, of course, I mean me. It's been a real challenge, <laughs> um, more so than I ever could have imagined. Uh, but this morning we decided to just sort of uh, keep everything simple, uh, sort of just strip everything down, uh, focus on what's most important. You know, when we set out to, to do this, uh, obviously we wanted to just give everybody an opportunity to connect with each other in, you know, the best way that we possibly could at a time like this when we're under, you know, a shelter-in-place order and, you know, the social distancing. Uh, we want to provide an opportunity for you to connect in the best way that we can. We want to provide, most importantly, an opportunity for us to, to study the, the scriptures together. I mean, that's really what's what's most important at a time like this, for us to be able to to study God's Word and to be encouraged through the Scriptures. And so that's what's most important. And so uh, we just wanted to keep it simple. We're not going to try to stream on, on two different platforms anymore. So hopefully all of you Facebook folks found your way over to the YouTube Live uh, stream. We figure that that'll uh, help us to, to rid ourselves of some of those technical problems. And um, we've, we've just sort of tried to, to sort of make it a little bit more laid back and a little bit easier for us to, to just study the Scriptures together. Uh, hopefully you were able to find uh, some of the worship hymns that uh, Pastor Stephen posted to the website uh, yesterday, and hopefully you were able to enjoy those and, and worship along. Uh, but this morning I'm excited because we're going to be able to uh, study uh, in First Thessalonians together, and actually we are on our last week studying in this letter, the last week studying First Thessalonians, and who would have thought, I know I didn't imagine this, but who would have thought that in our last week studying First Thessalonians that we would be doing it like this, you know, with, with me teaching basically to a camera and you all in your own homes uh, listening through a screen. I mean, I never would have imagined that this would be the way that we would finish up this series when we started back at the beginning of January. But I think it's exactly, you know, it, it's just always amazing to me uh, when we start studying a book of the Bible and we study, you know, verse by verse through the scriptures. It's always amazing to me to watch how God reveals that this is exactly the, the, the book that we were supposed to be studying. And, and it's always interesting to see that. And I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want us to, to talk about that further when we jump into this passage this morning. But it's just a testament to the fact that, that God sovereignly leads us into studying these passages and these books uh, that he wants us to be studying. Because I don't know if you've seen this or noticed this at all, but, but this has been the exact book that we as a body of believers needed to be studying during this time, over the last three months, it's just been incredible to see how each passage has, has spoken encouragement and instruction uh, to exactly what it was that we needed during the time that, that we needed it. And so I think that's a really incredible thing. Uh, but before we, we get to that, I do want to mention just a couple of things. Because of uh, the, the, the recent developments, um, the recent things that have been going on, because of the shelter-in-place orders that were issued uh, by the, the uh, Cherokee County Board of Commissioners and, and the uh, Mayor of, uh, of Waleska, uh, because of those different orders, uh, it is going to prevent us from being able to um, have our drive-up service on Palm Sunday. We had mentioned wanting to, to be able to do that on Palm Sunday, and both of those orders extend past Palm Sunday, and so if we're going to, to honor those orders, when you read through them, it, it's sort of impossible to both honor that order and gather together uh, at the church. And so um, we won't be able to do that on Palm Sunday, but we're still hoping to be able to get together, if those orders are lifted, to be able to get together and meet on Easter and, and in either that drive-up form or uh, in, in another way, maybe to, to, to meet on Easter. And so that's still the plan. And speaking of plans, I want you to know this, because I think this is important. This, uh, this format, you know, meeting online like this, I, I think that that it certainly serves a purpose. We've learned things. There are parts of this that I think we want to keep and carry on once things sort of resume. Um, but I want you to understand that this is this is a season. You know, this we're, there's going to be a time. We're not going to be worshiping from our homes and and through through screens forever, right? This is just a season of life. This is a season, a time. You know, and and so this isn't going to last forever. There's going to be a time where we're going to be gathered back together. 
worshiping, praising God together as the body of Christ again. And so I want you to know that we're planning for that. We're preparing for that. And, I, you know, we're realistic about it, you know, and I want you to be realistic about it. We're not going to wake up one morning in a couple of weeks and the risk and and everything has just vanished and disappeared. So we need to be realistic about that. You know, there, there are going to be, you know, we're going to have to be careful. We're going to have to be safe. We're going to have to take the lessons that we've learned over the last several weeks. And we're going to have to do this in a very smart way. But I think there's going to come a time very soon where we're going to have to sort of get this machine back in gear. And, and, and we're going to have to come up with a plan for meeting again and worshiping again together. And so I want you to know that we are planning and preparing for that. And we want to to do that um, as soon as it's safe to do so and as soon as we're able to do so. And so I want you to know that even though we are in this season right now, uh, we aren't just sort of sitting idle. We are planning. We're preparing. We've we've got, you know, ideas for the future and vision for the future. And so I want you to know that we're thinking about that. We're excited for that. And I want you to be excited for that as well. I want you to be praying for for what God's going to do in the next season. Um, And so, you know, I'm excited about, about those things. So again... If you have, uh, if you know of anyone, uh, I know that, that because of the the strain on the the economy, I know there there are folks in our community that that are starting to have needs. So if you have a need or you know someone uh, within our community or within you know our church family that, that has a need, please don't hesitate to reach out. There's a, a request, a prayer request form on our website. You can go there, uh, or you can call one of us. You can call me or our pastoral staff. Let us know if there's any way we can meet your needs or any way we can serve you. Please let us know. We want to be of service to you. Uh, so, so help us out with that. And I know many of you have asked about uh, Jimmy Hitt. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to pray for him. I'll continue to update you as Cheryl updates me. Uh, we just need to continue to pray for them. It's a scary time for them. And, and as I mentioned in the email, you know, when one member suffers, we all suffer together. And so we're in that with them. We're praying for them and with them. And I know that that's got to be a scary time uh, for Jimmy and for Cheryl and for Josh. And so we want to just be praying uh, for them and with them, and we, we certainly uh, are with them in prayer. So just continue to pray for them and lift them up. And uh, and so I think now would be a good time for us to pray and uh, pray for all of these things that are going on and pray that the Lord would bless our time of studying His Word together today. Okay, so let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your blessings, for your faithfulness. We pray, uh, Father, for all that you do for us. God, we pray uh, today for for all those uh, in our church and in our community that might be hurting in some way. Father, we do lift up uh, Brother Jimmy Hitt to you. We pray that you would watch over him, be with him, give him healing in his body. We pray for Cheryl and for Josh. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would uh, just comfort them during this time. Uh, We pray for all those that are hurting. Father, we pray for those that are struggling with anxiety and fear. We pray for those who are feeling uh, lonely or disconnected during this time that, that can be so isolating. We pray, Father, that you would just minister to them and be sufficient for them during this time. And Father, we pray, uh, Lord, that you would watch over us during this time of study this morning, that you would, uh, God, just speak to us through your Spirit, lead us, illuminate your Word so that it might be uh, just uh, bright before our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things, uh, Father, from your Word. And God, we just pray that uh, you would lead us, that we might understand, and not just that we might understand, but, Father, that our lives might be transformed by time spent in your word together this morning. God, we love you, we praise your name, and it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to be turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And as I mentioned, this is our last week studying 1 Thessalonians. We started studying 1 Thessalonians all the way back the beginning of January. And again, it's it's just amazing. Who would have thought when we started studying this, this letter that, that we would be dealing with so many of the very same things that the Thessalonians were dealing with. Now, you know, our situation is different. You know, our, our fear and our anxiety that we deal with are caused by different things than the Thessalonians' fear and anxiety was, were caused by. And, and the isolation and, and separation that we are dealing with is caused by something different than theirs was caused by. But the outcomes, and we've mentioned this, the outcomes, the, the same things they were dealing with, we're dealing with. And so I think it's very interesting. There's so many parallels. There's so many interesting dynamics that the, the things they were going through, the things they were dealing with, there's so many parallels, so many things that, that are similar. Uh, even I think about, and I've thought about this this week, um, you know, the, 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 the frustration that Paul felt. 
when he talks about wanting to minister to them in person, wanting to be with them, and to be able to minister to them in person. Remember, Paul was only able to be with them for a short time, and then he was run out of town. They even chased him out of Berea, which was the next town. And Paul says in this letter that he had tried to return to them. He had tried to come back to them in person on several different occasions, but he had been prohibited in one way or another from, from returning to them. And so now... Finally, he's being forced to, to communicate with them in a means that he really, it wasn't his first means, preferred means of communication, right? I mean, we know Paul is a letter writer. I mean, we know of him as a letter writer because that's what we have. But Paul was really a, an in-person kind of guy. That's the way he preferred to communicate. He wanted to communicate and minister to people in person. And so... It's only after he had tried to communicate with them in these other ways, it's only after he had tried to get to them and had been prevented that he finally, you know, sort of succumbs and says, okay, well, I'll write a letter if, that, if I can't do anything else. And so even, even that's a parallel, right? I mean, because we in the same way are, are separated from one another. And I can tell you right now, I will, I will be totally honest with you, this is not my preferred means of communication. And I will be the first to admit that if, I, if there was ever a doubt in my mind whether I wanted to be a, you know, TV preacher or, or somebody that communicates through a camera, no doubt, okay? This is not my preferred means of communication. And, but at a time like this, when we've been prevented from, from being with each other in any other way, God has provided a means for us to communicate with each other and for us to be with each other. And therefore, this is the means by which I can minister. And so it's it, it, it's just so interesting that this is the this is the the way that they were communicating. And so there's so many parallels, there's so many connection points. And so I think it's so incredible that that God led us to study this letter at this time, you know, where we're able to see all of these different, you know, points of connection through this letter. So now we've come to the end of this letter, to this final passage. And Paul wraps up this letter in a very similar way, sort of carrying out the themes that he's, that he's sort of been writing on throughout this entire letter. And so he finishes with one final instruction and one final encouragement. He's carried those two themes throughout the entire letter. He's been instructing them and he's been encouraging them. Instruction and encouragement, back and forth, almost in perfect balance. He's sort of back and forth gone between instructing them and encouraging them. And so that's, that's how he wraps up. That's how he finishes. He's going to instruct them. He's going to encourage them. Okay? And so I want us to see that. And I want us to understand the, the instruction, the encouragement. That's how he finishes. Now, we've talked before. Think about the, the scenarios you may have seen in a movie or in a book where someone's got one final chance to say something to someone. It always is something important. Right? They think deeply about the last thing they're going to say to someone. Paul is no different. If you look at the last thing he says in almost every one of his letters, it's usually something very important. It's no different here. His final instruction, his final encouragement, they're both very important things, and that's, that's what he begins with. So look at verse 20. That's where you see the final instruction. And don't let it confuse you because you might uh, immediately think, well, this is a lot of things. This is not just one thing, but they're all sort of connected together. So it's one instruction with sort of several parts. And look at what he says in, in verse 20. We're going to start there. Verse 20, what does he say? He says, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Now again, you might look at that and at first glance you might say, well now wait a second, that's a lot of things. That's not just one instruction, that's a lot of instruction. But these are all tied together. So every one of these things is sort of it's sort of tied together. They're all there together. So let's start with that first clause or that first statement that, that he gives us there in verse 20. He says, do not despise prophecies. And the first question that we have to ask is, what does Paul mean by prophecy? And the definition of prophecy, and it doesn't matter where you're looking in Scripture, there's some people that say there are different definitions of, of prophecy throughout Scripture, but really prophecy always has one definition we just tend to think of it as different things. But prophecy really always has one running definition, and that is that it's revelation from God. Okay, so prophecy is always revelation from God. That's what it always is. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, that's what it always is, just revelation from God. 
we just always tend to think of it in a very narrow sense, okay? So we tend to always think of it in, in, in one place. We always tend to think of prophecy in the Old Testament, okay? And so here's, here's the, the reason I say that. In the Old Testament, a lot, most of the time when we think of the Old Testament, God's revelation was not written down at that point, okay? So when God was giving revelation to the prophets in, in the Old Testament. It had not been written down yet. And so everything he was giving them was brand new, right? It was, it was all completely brand new. And so he was giving this revelation to them, and it had never been given. It was, it was brand new. It was totally brand new. And so it, it, it all seemed just completely brand new to them, right? And so what, what was it? It seemed like things that were totally in the future and totally brand new. And, and it was like, wow, th- these prophets have this new, shiny, brand new revelation. And so then the Old Testament prophets would write it down. Now, we tend to always think of prophecy in that way, right? Because a lot of times if, if, if I asked you just or asked anyone on the street what prophecy is, nine times out of ten, somebody's going to say, it's when you tell the future, right? That nine times out of ten, that's what somebody's going to say when you ask them what prophecy is. Always when you, somebody tells the future. But that's really not what it is. It's just we think that that that's what it is because we're always thinking about the Old Testament because when God gave the prophets revelation, it was things that had not been written down before. And so it usually was things that was still in the future because it had not been written down. But then they wrote it down. And when the New Testament authors talked about the Old Testament prophets, well, it was not in the future anymore, right? It was in the past. So you think about it. it prophecy is always things is always God's revelation, right? It's always God's revelation. That's what it always is. So you think about it in the, in the New Testament, okay? In the New Testament, when God spoke to the apostles, when he inspired their writings by the Holy Spirit, right? When he spoke through them and he inspired their writings, right? Then they, remember in the New Testament, most of the New Testament wasn't written down for that first long, long period of time. And then they wrote it down, okay? And, and their, you know, their writings, this was revelation from God, okay? But here's the important thing, right? This is what's so important for us to understand. The definition of prophecy doesn't ever change. It doesn't matter whether you're in the Old Testament, the New Testament, or right now. It's always revelation from God. And here's something that's so important for us to understand. God doesn't give new scripture today, right? So, so it's not like God's out there right now going, hey, write this down and staple it to the back of your Bible. He's not giving new scripture today. Okay, so there's, there's no, he's not out there giving new scripture that we're supposed to staple to the back of Revelation and, and that's new inspired scripture. He's not doing that today. So how does, how does God tell us, you know, what are we supposed to do? What is Paul talking about when he says, don't despise prophecies? He's saying, don't despise the revelation of God. Well, what's the revelation of God? It's the scriptures. It is the prophecies of the Old Testament. It's the, the God's revelation of the Old Testament. It's the writings of the apostles and the, the, the words of Christ Jesus in the New Testament. It's God's revelation. Remember, the definition never changes. It's always God's Revelation. It's why Paul said in Ephesians 2.20 that the foundation of the church was the apostles and the prophets and the chief cornerstone was Christ Jesus. Okay, the church is built upon the apostles, the prophets, and the chief cornerstone is Christ Jesus. The definition never changes of prophecy. It's always God's revelation. And for us, the church, this is God's revelation. There's no new prophecy being being given today. And it's important for us to, to make that distinction. There's no new prophecy being given. There's no new revelation of, of God being given. God's not out there giving new revelation today and, and saying, hey, here's some new revelation. Go, go add that to your Bibles. He's not doing that today. He's given us all the revelation that we need in the Scriptures. That's everything that we need. This is what we need. So when Paul says... Don't despise the prophecies. Don't despise, he's saying, don't despise God's revelation. Don't despise 
God's Word. Don't despise the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Don't neglect the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Don't avoid the teaching and preaching of God's Word. So think of this in the context of the church, because remember, he's writing to a church. And so he's telling them, listen, don't neglect, don't despise, don't find ways to get around the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Don't find ways around the revelation of God's Word. Don't find ways around being in the presence of teaching and preaching of God's Word. And here's why that's important. Paul understood that their teaching had been cut short. Remember, Paul had been removed from them, right? He had been taken out of their their presence. They had not received all of the teaching and preaching they needed. And so Paul says, listen, it's so important. This is the final instruction. It's so important for you to get in front of some teaching and preaching. You don't need to avoid it. You don't need to get away from it. You don't need to despise the revelation of God. You need to get in front of the teaching and preaching of God's Word. And it's going to be so important for you at this moment, this critical juncture of your life when you're going through all this persecution and you're dealing with all of these different things and you're feeling isolated from the community of God and you're dealing with all of this stuff you're dealing with. Paul says, I'm writing you letters and that's great and that's good, but it's only going to take you so far because you need to be in front of the teaching and preaching of God's word. You've got to find a way to be in front of teaching and preaching God's word. It's critical. And not only should you not be despising it, but the scriptures tell us what our attitude towards the teaching and preaching of God's word ought to be. And it ought to be something that we long for and desire. Now, I know what you might be thinking. You might be sitting there saying, well, you're a preacher. Of course you want us to long for and desire the preaching of God's word. But it's not just because I'm a preacher. It's because that's what the scriptures tell us. The Bible tells us that our attitude towards God's Word ought to be one of of longing. We ought to hunger for God's Word. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but listen to what, what the Scriptures say. This is in the 119th Psalm. It says, Open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your law. I'm a sojourner on the earth, right? That's, that's like an alien, a stranger on the earth. He says, I'm a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed. Listen to that. My soul is consumed with longing for your word at all times. That's the attitude that ought to be, the attitude of our heart and of our soul and of our mind for the word of God. He says, my soul is consumed with longing for your word. That's what it ought to be, right? My soul is consumed, God, with longing for your word. That's what it should be. He says, my soul clings to the dust, O God. Give me life according to your word. That should be the attitude of our hearts towards the teaching and preaching of God's word. Paul says, listen... Right now, you are like a soul clinging to the dust in a dry and thirsty land. You are like a soul clinging. You're dehydrated. You're parched. You've been alienated. You've been isolated. You are separated from everything, right? You're you're apart from that wellspring. And he says, you know what's going to plug you back in? He says, pray and ask the Lord to give you life according to his word. So he says, first of all, don't despise the revelation of God. Don't avoid the teaching and preaching of God's word. He says, that's the one thing you don't want to avoid at a time like this. I mean, think about it. Paul could have given them any other instruction, so many other things. He could have said, hey, make sure you spend time together. Lean on each other during this time. Make sure that you're together during this time. He could have said any other thing. Pray for each other during this time. He could have said anything else. But what does he say? Listen, guys, here's one thing you don't want to do right now. Don't start neglecting the revelation of God. Don't start despising and getting away from the revelation of God. Don't get away from God's word. Don't get away from the teaching and preaching of God's word. That's the thing you can't do without right now. Because your soul clings to the dust. And God's word will give you life. Now, he doesn't stop there, right? He doesn't stop there. There's something else. Look at what he says, and this is, this is very important. He starts there in verse 20. He says, do not despise the prophecies. And listen to what he says. He says, but test everything. 
Now, this is so important, okay? He says, but test everything. So, okay, let's, let's assume we've gotten in front of good teaching, okay? We've gotten in front of, we've gotten in front of the teaching. We've gotten in front of, of the teaching. We haven't neglected it. We haven't abandoned it. We haven't despised the teaching of God's Word. We've gotten in front of it. So Paul says, okay, you've gotten in front of the teaching. He says, now test it. <laughs> what? Now, most of us, you know, really, we, we might balk at that. We might think, well, wait a second, I'm not supposed to, to test? I'm not supposed to test the teaching? Now, maybe uh, you, and, and I, I grew up uh, at some points going to, to churches like this, too. Maybe you grew up in a church where, where that was like a big no-no. You don't, you don't, you don't test or, 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 or question the, the preacher. That was a big no-no. You're not supposed to question what the preacher says. You just take what the preacher says, and, and you accept it. But here's the thing. Paul says, no, you test it. You test it. You use discernment and you be wise and you be judicious and you open up your Bible and you use the brain that God has given you and you test what's being said. Now listen, okay, let's be careful here because being wise and being discerning and being judicious is, is different than sowing seeds of discord, right? Being wise and discerning is is different than, you know, than complaining because, you know, he didn't tell the jokes that you liked him to tell, right? I mean, those, those things are different. But he says, you test this. Test what's being said. And, and why? Why are we supposed to do that? Why is it okay for us to do that? Well, because the Bible tells us that not every person that gets up to teach or to preach is doing so rightly. They're not, all, they're not all doing it the right way. They're not all doing it well. In fact, the Bible tells us there are false teachers. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, he told his followers, he told his followers, he said, listen, there are false teachers who are wolves parading around in sheep's clothing trying to devour the sheep, and you have to beware of them. In Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible tells us that a mature Christian will be strong and well-practiced in the power of discernment, knowing how to discern between good, right, biblical things and evil, sinful things. That's what the mature Christian does. They know how to practice discernment. They are judicious. When they, when they sit under teaching, they open their Bibles and they use the brain that God has given them and they follow along and they say, is what this person teaching, is what this person's preaching, is it biblical? Are they teaching the scriptures? Or are they teaching something else? Or when they open a book and they start reading, they get out their Bible and they say, is this book teaching the same thing that's in the scriptures? Or is it teaching something different? Or when they're listening to someone, listen, this is a, a, an easy thing to do right now. This, the, the, there's, this is so easy to happen right now because we're disconnected from the church, right? We're disconnected physically from the church. And there's, there's a multitude of things available right now online. We see this stuff on social media. You're, you're leaning towards all this other stuff right now because they're so available online and, and you've got books, you've got all this different stuff. And so it would be so easy right now to, to not be discerning and to just sort of take anything and everything. And so a mature Christian, we have to, to take things and we have to be discerning. And we have to take God's word and hold it up against whatever it is that we're listening to or hearing or reading. We have to be discerning. He says, test it. And then that leads to the next thing, right? So he says, first you get in front of, of teaching, right? You put yourself in front of it. Don't despise it. Don't neglect it. Don't get away from it. He says, put yourself in front of teaching. He says, be discerning. Test it. Be wise. And then what does he say, right? Not just those things. You don't stop short there. Look at what he says. He says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. And then look, hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. Hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. This is where we get into the practical part of this. This is the practical part of this instruction. Because all too often what, what I think happens is we, we do those first two parts of this, right? We, we do put ourselves in front of teaching. 
and we find opportunities for ourselves to, to receive teaching. And I think as mature Christians, as I know many of you are, we, we are wise and discerning, and we do listen, and we, we do listen with wisdom, and we say, okay, this is biblical teaching, or this isn't biblical teaching, and we, we are discerning. And then once we've made that, that discerning call, and we say, okay, this is, this is biblical teaching, and we say, wow, that's, that's great teaching, that's, you know, that's, or, or, or whatever we say, you know, you say, okay, that's whatever. But then all too often the problem is, is that then when it comes the time to put it into practice, when it comes time to really take action on something, that's when we stop short. And that's what Paul's really talking about here. When he uses these imperative words, when he says, hold fast or abstain, right? He's saying, take it, hold on to it, put it into practice, allow your life and your actions and, and your thoughts, allow yourself to be shaped by the good, and then abstain. Allow your life equally to be shaped by your absence of these other things, of the evil things, of your ability to abstain from the wrong things, the evil things, the, the sinful things. He says abstain from them. Over and over again, Paul uses uh, the word for, you know, to put into practice. So he says this, for, for example, in his letter to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul, Paul uses that word to put it into practice. And I love what he says in, in Philippians chapter 4 because uh, he uses this sort of sequence. And he says this in Philippians 4, 9. He says, uh, what you have learned and what you have received and what you have heard and what you have seen, put it into practice. And I love that because essentially what he's, what he's saying, and this is advice that I think every one of us ought to, to take seriously, right? I mean, because... Because this is what he's basically saying to them. I mean, he's saying, look, everything that, that, you've, everything that you've learned from me, everything that you've received from me, everything that you've heard from me, everything that you've seen me do, all of it, now put it into practice. It's not good enough just to, to hear it. It's not good enough just to, to receive it. It's not good enough just to, to see it done. It's not good enough just to, now you have to put it into practice. There's another step involved. There's that practical rubber meets the road step involved. And you know, how many times parents, I mean, you guys know this, right? And I've learned this in an acute way during these last couple of weeks, right? I mean, how many times have you gotten on eye level, you know, with, with a child and, and, and you've said, listen, I need you to do more than just hear me. I need you to do what I'm asking you to do. You know, I need you to do more than just listen. I need you to actually do it. And I remember the other day having a similar conversation, and I remember at the moment I was having that conversation, I remember thinking to myself, I bet you every time I have this conversation, God is is looking down at me thinking the exact same thing about me. Aaron, I, I need you to do more than just listen. I need you to do more than just receive and hear and see. I need you to put these things into practice. But that's so often where we fall short, isn't it? I mean, we hear these things and we read them in the scriptures and we receive them and we, we hear them but then Paul says, now put them into practice. He said something similar to Timothy, who was his young disciple in, in 1 Timothy. You know, in, in chapter 4, verse 15, Paul said, Timothy, I need you to practice these things. And then he said this, and I think it was neat because he's clarifying what he means. Paul said, I need you to practice these things. And he said, immerse yourself in them. In other words, allow your entire life to be transformed by these things. It should, it should change you. It should, it should change everything about the way that you think and the way that you speak and the way that you act. And so Paul's saying literally to the Thessalonians, he's saying, okay, put yourself in front of teaching. I and mean, this is the sum of this instruction, okay? And remember, this is that final instruction. This is the last bit of instruction that Paul's going to give to them. And he says, look, here's what I need you to do. Put yourself 
in front of teaching. Don't neglect it. Don't avoid it. This is the wrong time to do that. I know you're under persecution. I know that you're fearful and anxious. I know that you're going through a lot. But don't neglect the good teaching. Put yourself in front of it. And once you do that, be wise, be discerning, test it. Use that brain of yours and test it. But once you've determined that it's good, solid, sound, biblical teaching, then you take that teaching and you put it into practice. Immerse yourself in it. Live it. Become it. Be transformed by it. That's the instruction. When these Thessalonians shuffled home to their houses after hearing this letter being read that night, and they blew out their lanterns or whatever they had, and they laid their heads down to sleep, this was the instruction that was, that was mulling through their heads that night as they were going off to sleep. This was the thing that kept rattling around in their brains. Get in front of teaching, be wise and discerning, and then allow your lives to be transformed by that teaching. And listen, like I said, this is a hard time for us. I mean, let's, let's draw the connection point. This is a difficult time that we live in for us to really take that, that teaching and, and that instruction to heart. Because it's a hard time right now for us to put ourselves in front of teaching. Because which one of us prefers a computer screen to real connection, real face-to-face teaching? It's not fun to learn from a computer screen. But Paul says you put yourself in front of teaching. And when we're separated from the body physically, it's hard to be It's hard to be responsible and discerning and judicious and wise and to test the things that we're hearing and reading and seeing. But we have to do that. We have to be careful about the things we allow in there. And then once we've we've determined that it's right and that it's good and that it's biblical, then we can't just let those things sit. We have to allow our lives to be transformed. We We have to practice these things. That's the instruction. That's what he gives us. Now, here's the thing. He moves on from that instruction to this, to this encouragement, okay? This final word of encouragement. And we're not going to spend much time here because it's basically a summary of the encouragement that he's given us all throughout uh, the letter. But I want us to at least hit on it because I think it is very profound. And I think it's a great way to close out this letter. But here's what he says. And this is what he, he gives us beginning in verse... 23, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Now here's the first thing I want you to notice. First thing I want you to notice is in in every bit of this encouragement, Paul places the emphasis on the fact that it is God doing all of this. And let's be honest, the Thessalonians needed to hear that. We need to hear that. They were, they were broken. They were weak. They were frail. They were, they were having a difficult time. And it was at this moment that they really needed to hear that God had them, that he was holding them up, that he was carrying them, that he was going to accomplish for them everything that, that he had started. And that's right where Paul starts. He says, listen, he's going to sanctify you. The God of peace is going to sanctify you completely. In other words, God is going to finish everything that he started in you. This process, everything, this process of salvation, sanctification that God started in you, guess what, Thessalonians? He's going to finish it. He's going to carry it through. He's going to take it through to completion in you. That burden doesn't rest on you. He's going to carry it through. So be encouraged. And then he's going to preserve you, body, soul, and spirit, blameless at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to preserve you. Are you weak? Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Don't worry. He'll preserve you. And then here's the final thing. This is one of the greatest passages. I think it's one of the greatest assurances that we have. He says, he is faithful. He will surely do it. Now, here's why I love this passage. Okay? He is faithful. He will surely do it. Once again, he reaffirms he's going to do it. But what I love about this is he doesn't just tell us what he's going to do. He tells us why he's going to do it. And the reason I love that 
is because a lot of times we start to get this feeling or we start to get this sense that the burden is on us, that if God's going to, to complete our salvation, if he's going to complete our sanctification, if he's going to do something for us, then it will be because of, of our righteousness or because we were faithful or because we were good or because of something in us. And the problem with that is that when, when rough times come, when things like this happen, the world around us, all the craziness that's going on. And our faithfulness begins to tremble. Our resolve begins to bend. Then what happens to our entire belief system? If we believe that our salvation, our hope, our assurance is built on our own faithfulness, if we believe that it's built on our, our righteousness, our goodness, then in moments like this, our hope crumbles. But Paul says, good news, it's not built on your faithfulness. It's not built on your righteousness. It's not built on your goodness. It's not built on anything to do with you. It's built on God's righteousness, His faithfulness, His goodness. What assurance does that give us? What hope does that give us? He says he's going to do it. Not because of you. Not because of your faithfulness. Not because you've been you know, super faithful and strong and great and good through all this. He says, Thessalonians, you're weak. You're insufficient. You're about to crumble. Great. He isn't going to save you because of how strong you are. He isn't going to save you because of how faithful you've been through all of this. And praise God for that. He's going to save you and sanctify you and preserve you blameless because of how faithful He is. And folks, that's something we can rejoice in. That's something we can give glory to God. That's something that we can praise and worship Him for. That's something that ought to bring joy and gladness into our hearts because well, that's something that ought to bring joy to us. That's something, that's something that ought to lead us to glorify Him. Our salvation is assured, not because of our faithfulness, but because of His. Here's the thing. Who knows what the next few weeks are going to hold? Only God knows that. It would be silly for us to even try to predict it. But I do know this. Our God reigns. He reigns completely and sovereignly over all things. He has poured His grace and His mercy so abundantly into our lives. And He has assured us of our salvation, not because of our faithfulness, but because of His. And therefore, we can rejoice. We can be glad. We can have hope. It's in times like these where things are, are difficult. But He's still called us. He still has a purpose and a plan for us still has instruction for us. And that gives us a reason to wake up every morning and be excited about a brand new day. I'm excited about the days to come. Next week is, is Palm Sunday. The week after that is Easter. I'm not sure what we're going to study after that. I'm excited about where the Lord will lead us, though. I want to thank you for, for joining us this morning. We're going to pray, and then we'll, we'll close after that. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we do thank you for the time that you've given us to study your word. We thank you, uh, Lord, for this passage that it does encourage us and it calls us, Father, to, to spend time before your word, to spend time, Father, learning and studying, but also, Lord, practicing the things that we learn from your word. God, we're also this morning encouraged by the fact that, that you've assured us of our salvation by your grace through faith in Christ Jesus not because of our faithfulness, not because of our goodness, but because of your grace, because of your righteousness, because of your faithfulness to us. So, Father, we ask that you would watch over us. We ask that you would go with us. Uh, Lord, we praise you for all that you do. And it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being with us as part of this live stream this morning. I pray that God would bless you in this upcoming week. I do want to encourage you to 
Join us for our live stream on Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock. Of course, our uh, live stream will open up uh, probably about an hour early so that you can connect with one another. If that's something that you want to do, you can connect and um, share prayer requests or updates. And, of course, we'll update you uh, as we have updates uh, on any in our church that, uh, that need prayer. Uh, but thank you again for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, it's been a joy to be with you, and you have a great week. God bless. Okay.